everyone, and thank you for joining us today. My name is Sam Adams Lanham. I'm the Community Engagement Librarian at the Barrington Area Library. So that means it is my job to work for the benefit of and alongside our local nonprofits, um, such as the League of Women Voters will be presenting today. So I'm going to turn it over to, I, I'm sorry, I have a couple technical things to share with you and you may have heard some of the chatter. Um, first, we are asking if that you leave your camera turned off and that you leave yourself muted throughout. Um, and there, we're gonna turn chat off as well. So we are recording. We want this to be as smooth as possible. So we appreciate your cooperation. Thank you very much. And Kathy, I will ask you to speak now. Thank you for attending today's candidate forum featuring the candidates running for the Barrington School District 220 board. My name is Kathy Cortez and I'm a candidate forum coordinator for the League of Women Voters of the Palatine area, which serves not only Palatine, but several contiguous communities with whom we share legislative districts. Founded in 1920, the League of Women Voters is a nonpartisan political organization that neither supports, opposes, nor recommends candidates for office. The League was founded here in Chicago in 1920 in order to help educate and inform new female voters who had just acquired the right to vote. The League's purpose is to promote responsibility through the informed and active participation of citizens in providing this forum enables members of the community to become better informed about the issues facing the community and the candidates running for office. We're pleased to offer this service to you. We'd like to extend our sincerest thanks to Sam Adams, who is the community engagement librarian for the Barrington Area Library. And without her help, uh, we would have not really been able to pull this together. So thank you, uh, Sam, as our, our co-host today. And she will be operating this webinar. Today's presentation um, uh, will have all audience members muted with the exception of candidates. We will not be using chat or raised hand features. Instead, all questions for candidates were submitted by the audience at the time of registration or we received them from local nonpartisan organizations in the community. And now I'm pleased to introduce our moderator for today's forum, Kim Inman. Kim's been a member of the League of Women Voters for the past five years. She currently serves as the League of Women Voter Palatine Area Vice President, and she served as an election judge for 17 years. Interestingly, Kim joined the uh, League after attending a school board forum because she was so impressed with how it was run. Kim has since moderated many forums and we're very fortunate she's able to be with us this afternoon. Kim? Thank you, Kathy, and thank you as well, Sam. Um, good afternoon. It's my pleasure to be here with you on this beautiful spring day to moderate this forum. Um, as a resident of Palatine, I'm not eligible to vote in this election, so I've been asked to serve as the impartial facilitator for this discussion. Um, let me take just a couple minutes to explain the format and the rules for this forum. All the candidates were contacted by mail, email, or phone, and have agreed to abide by the ground rules provided by the League of Women Voters. These are our rules. Candidates have drawn numbers to determine speaking order. I'll rotate this order during the forum for the questions. Each candidate will have one minute for an opening statement. Next, each candidate will have one minute to answer each question. I will repeat the question if necessary. If needed, a, a rebuttal may be requested and each candidate will have a maximum of two rebuttals. Rebuttals will be timed and limited to 30 seconds each. At the end of the question period, each candidate will have a one minute closing statement. Okay, we have, uh, we have timers for today. Um, the candidates will be given a 30 and 15 second warning. So please quickly complete your thoughts when you see the stop card. Time limits will be enforced out of respect for all candidates. Questions have been submitted by audience members and we've edited them for clarity, appropriateness, and to avoid duplication. We're hoping to have a few questions that you haven't heard before. Um, candidates have been asked not to interrupt one another. And today's forum will be taped for the League of Women Voters for educating the public. A video of this forum will be available next week on the League's, uh, League's website. 
and the Barrington Area Library website. And the candidates have all agreed to this. Um, I'm not seeing any campaign signs, but I must read this disclaimer. No campaign signs, buttons, or partisan materials may be visible on screen. No voice image or other duplication of the form may be used by a candidate's representative or campaign in any campaign advertising. The League of Women Voters claims copyright ownership of all recordings or transcripts produced from this event and reserves the right to publicize this forum. To view this forum, go to the League website, lwvpalatineareaorg Today, we're going to hear from 10 candidates hoping to serve on the, the Barrington District 220 School Board. One candidate had a last minute emergency, Maggie McGonigal, and she will not be here this afternoon. Uh, with us today and on the ballot are William Betts. If you want to raise a little hand, thank you. Sandra Fick Bradford. Thank you. Aaron Chan Ding. Katie, oh, I'm sorry, Katie Car Karam. Karam. Sorry. It's okay. Yeah. Lauren Berkowitz Clower. Jonathan Mata. Thomas, and again, I need to ask your last name. Mitori. Mitori. Tom Mitori. Yeah, Hello. Yeah, okay. Mike, Mike Shackleton. Steve Wang. And Robert Winden. Okay, great, thank you. All right, I want to thank you all for your participation and all the work you've put in so far. And we'll begin with your one minute opening statements. And as, our, as we drew the names earlier, Lauren Clower will be going first with her opening statement. So one minute, Lauren. Okay, you ready? Yes, if you're ready, <laughs> okay. we're ready, yeah. I'm ready. Um, I'm Lauren Berkowitz Flower. Um, I'm from Barrington. I grew up in Barrington. I'm a mother of two children now in the school district. Um, I have planned to run for the school board for quite a while now. I kind of waited until timing was right and my kids were old enough. Um, my, I've said it a few times before, but I grew up, while I was growing up, my dad um, served three um, terms on the school board. And so I know the importance and the impact of this role. And it is really important. Um, I'm not running because of one issue. I'm not running because I'm angry. This wasn't a whim. Um, timing and thought uh, really made this the right time for me. If I'm elected, I plan to build trust through uh, respectful uh, communication. I plan to serve with an open mind. I plan to listen to all sides of issues at hand. And I plan to be a vote for our community and most importantly, for our students. The end. <laughs> thank you. All right, thank you so much. Um, Next, Sandra. Thank you. So thank you to the League of Women Voters for having us here today, I appreciate it. My name is Sandra Ficky Bradford and I'm running for re-election. My husband and I are the proud parents of three diversely talented children who are raised in the Barrington 220 schools. To learn more about us and my priorities, visit my website, sandrafor220.com. For this election, the community needs experience, continuity, transparencies, and always fiscal responsibility. During this term, the board will introduce a new superintendent, embark on a new strategic plan that will set the direction for our students for years to come. They will affirm the equity statement, set priorities on the pandemic, and negotiate several contracts. The 220 community needs experienced board members who can serve without a steep learning curve. It needs board members who can work together and solve problems. I personally have contributed to now 22 consecutive years of a balanced budget while introducing amazing new programs for our students. I also have two engineering degrees. I, I am driven every day to make the schools the best they can be, and I feel a responsibility to continue doing so. So thank you. Perfect. <laughs> time. Thank you. Thank you so much. Um, next up is Erin Chan Ding. Hi, thank you to the League of Women Voters. My name is Erin Chan Ding, and my husband and I have lived in District 220 for about a decade. We have a son at Station Middle School in sixth grade and a daughter who's in second grader at Countryside Elementary. They're both happily back in hybrid 2.0 and really looking forward to going back to school full time soon. I'm running for a seat on the 220 Board of Education because I love our community. I'm so grateful for the education our kids have received and I want to serve. I'm the proud daughter of two immigrants from Hong Kong and it is my sincere desire to bring a fresh voice to 220 and to represent the community mosaic we love so much. Core to who I am as a person and how I'd like to serve are three E's, equity in all things, effective communication, 
in exceptional stewardship. I'm looking forward to using these three lenses in partnering with a new superintendent and developing a strategic plan with strong community input. I'm honored to have received an endorsement from the Daily Herald this week, which sought candidates who are knowledgeable and interested on a variety of issues. Please check out erinfor220.com for more about our campaign and I hope to earn your vote. Thank you. Thank you. All right, uh, next up is Robert Winden. You're Thank welcome. you very much. Um, so I'm Robert Winden. My wife, Allison, and I have lived uh, essentially in the district since 2007. Um, we did a three-year hiatus where uh, my wife's job took us overseas and we lived in Munich, Germany. Uh, we are live in the village which are two, with our two children, a sophomore at Barrington High School and a sixth grader at Station Middle School. Um, through their participation in the Chinese immersion program before we moved overseas, we've had the opportunity to experience just about every school district or every school in the district. Um, I am running because of, as we emerge from this COVID pandemic, I believe I can bring a fresh perspective to the district board while at the same time bringing experience as somebody who has served on the Village of Barrington board in the past. Um, I think I can help us to engage the community uh, regain the trust of the community and work with board members of different opinions and different backgrounds and bring us together and move forward as a, as a community. Thank you. Thank you. All right, uh, next up is Mike Shackleton. Mike, you're Hi. Um, Thanks to the Women's League for hosting um, this forum. Um, Mike Shackleton here, I'm running for reelection for a couple of reasons. Uh, the main one being uh, to give back to the community, a community which I was fortunate to go to school in myself a long time ago, um, and one that my wife and I have two children in the district <clears throat> and have for the last over seven years. Um, another reason, I think, especially at this time of uncertainty, uh, <clears throat> coming and change, you know, not just coming out of this crisis, but also with the leadership of the new board, as well as uh, of the district. Continuity and experience, I think will be great assets, or mine in particular, uh, to the district. Um, I also think we have a unique opportunity, same reasons of all this possible change here, new change, to do things better. Uh, than we have in in some in several key areas. So I hope you'll vote for me. Thank you. Thank you so much. All right. Next up is um, Tom Mitterai. Uh, thank you, League of Women Voters, for organizing this forum. It's another fantastic opportunity for us to listen and share our perspectives. My name is Tom Mitterai, and I have been a resident of Barrington for about twelve years with my wife Elba and our five children. We have attended three of the schools within the district. My wife is a kindergarten teacher at Sunny Hill, and we have benefited from the tremendous opportunities provided by this district here, and we have seen some of the challenges. So how can I bring value to the district as a board member? I have over 30 years of experience leading large design and construction organizations in the United States, Navy, and private industry. I've had a variety of responsibilities, <clears throat> including the management of a $7 billion program budget. I'm in my 11th year on the faculty at Northwestern University, and my experiences have all been grounded in fiscal responsibility and a commitment to service for others. You can learn more about my background at townfor220.com. I see membership on the board as an honor and a privilege with the responsibility to listen carefully, deliberate thoughtfully, and communicate effectively. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, next up, Katie Karam. I am Katie Karam. I was born and raised in Barrington, and I'm so happy to raise my three kids in the community that helped raise me. Starting next year, I'll have a child at Roslyn Road, Prairie, and BHS, so I'm going to be in the thick of it at all levels of our district. I've served on the Roslyn Road PTO for years, and I know firsthand the volunteer efforts that go into making our district successful. I've been following board meetings for years, and I'm running for three main reasons. So this is the part where I normally say we need our kids back in full time. Um, while I'm elated for the children of D220 that the district has announced a full-time return to school, we need to form a plan to deal with future crises. Our board was not able to work as a unit in the best interests of our students, and we need a pandemic plan in place to meet, ensure keeping our children in school safely is our number one priority. priority. 
Number two, ushering a new era of fiscal transparency and ensuring our tax dollars are used in the best interest of our community. And finally, holding our board accountable to our taxpayers. No more surveying the community only to ignore their voice. Thanks so much. Uh, next up is William Betts. Hi, good afternoon. I'm running for school board because I have three children in the school district, the youngest of which is in third grade. So I have a vested interest in making sure that our schools continue to be great for a very long time to come. In addition, I'm a homeowner. So I see the, uh, the taxes that we spend and have a, a vested interest in making sure that our tax dollars are spent wisely. And finally, I'm a medical doctor who's actively practicing. And I think I can really help in making sure that we um, keep our schools open and open safely. There's going to be a large number of issues that come up over the course of the next year and making sure that happens. We're going to be negotiating contracts with the teachers and we're going to deal with issues such as their sick leave and what, they, what we do with teachers who decide not to get COVID vaccines, seasonal flu vaccines, um, students, how do we handle their social distancing, uh, contact sports, how they return from sick days, and then potential um, issues with, that could be very, very expensive depending on how our school district uh, handles it including ventilation systems, PPE, and sanitizing regimes. I hope to help with all of that. Thank you. Thank you, William. Um, next up is Steve Wang. Steve, your opening, please. Thank you, Kim. Well, and thank you to the League of Women Voters as well for hosting this forum. We do appreciate this. Well, again, I'm Steve Wang, and I'm running for the board uh, because I have a daughter who's seven years old and at, at the CI program at Countryside Elementary. And so I'm gonna be in it for the long haul. She's in first grade. and. I'm committing to running because I have three platforms that I would like to state. First being financial responsibility, making sure that we use our resources the best that we possibly can. Secondly, leading a school district that is at the top of the, at the, top of the charts in terms of rankings and performance. Third, accountability for myself, for what I do and the decisions I make that, that are in the best interest of our students as well as our taxpayers. And when I look at our district, I see wonderful, I see wonderful students, I see engaged citizens, and I see fantastic teachers. And to me, that's a winning formula for success. And I would like to be a part of that with, and contribute my 15 years of corporate finance experience in decision-making and financial uh, responsibility and making sure that we usher in this new era with a new, with a new board, as well as a new uh, set of board members to provide the best district available for our taxpayers and students. Thank you. All right, last up, Jonathan Mata. Thank you. Thank you for the opportunity to be here. I appreciate it. My name is Jonathan Matta. I'm also known as Juan Matta. Um, my, my wife and I reside in the village of Barrington. We've been here for about 10 years. We have three children, a 10 year old, um, sorry, a 12 year old at, at uh, Prairie Middle, a 10 year old at Huff, and then a, a little four year old troublemaker. Um, we're not from here. We came here for a lot of the same reasons 10 years ago that a lot of people come here for values, integrity, um, wide open acceptance, regardless of where you come from, and common sense. Um, and I'm seeking to serve the community. My, my professional background is in design. Um, I definitely feel um, I bring really varied perspectives, almost divergent perspectives to complex problems. And I, you know, I'm really committed to the user. The user of the school system is our students. I'm committed to creative leadership and I'm really committed to a strategic vision that sustains the value that brought everybody to Barrington and why people wanna be here. Thanks. Okay, now we're going to rotate our order. So um, for the next question, Sandra will be up first. And this, this moves into the question part. Um, we're going to get a little bit personal here, then we're going to move on to issues. Um, tell us about your career and life experiences that makes you the most qualified person for this role on the board. Great, thank you for that question. So I have been on the board for 12 years. I have served six years on the finance committee and I've served six years on the policy committee. So I think I'm well qualified um, to serve the district um, from, my, from my own board experience. I also have um, a professional experience too. Um, I have had, um, let's see, I've been in, in the industry now for 30 years. Um, I have two engineering degrees, one from Purdue and one from, one from Northwestern. I have worked as a legal operations person. I've worked in vendor management. I have worked in software management. I've worked in many areas of corporations. I've managed budgets that are as large and larger than the district, um, the district's budget. 
So I feel that I am well qualified, not just with my own board experience, but my professional experience as well. So thank you. Thank you. Okay, uh, next up on this question, I'll read the question again. Is Aaron will answer it next. Tell us about your career and life experience. Tell us about your career and life experience that make you the most qualified person for this role on the board. Yes, absolutely. So I am a full-time freelance journalist. So my livelihood is based on asking people questions, listening to their stories, listening to their concerns. So for me, when I don't understand something or I wanted to understand something further, I'll go to the people, I'll go to that community and I'll say, hey, help walk me through. You know, I, I talk to current and former board members about our budget, about our strong AAA bond rating, about the fact that we have a healthy fund balance. And they walk me through all of these uh, pieces of financial health so that because our, our, we're financially healthy, we can concentrate on education. Uh, I do also have experience uh, as an executive uh, at a nonprofit, a national nonprofit. And while there, I served on an executive board uh, with governance and oversight duties, and I managed a $1.2 million budget as well. So I have that experience to bring. Thanks. Thank you. Thank you. Um, next up is going to be Robert. Robert, tell us about your career and life experiences that make you the most qualified person for this role on the board. Thank you. So from a career perspective, um, I'm an attorney. Uh, I spent uh, just about six and a half years as a county prosecutor um, in Woodstock. So for the McHenry County State's Attorney's Office with um, over two years of that handling uh, juvenile cases, working with schools, working on school safety issues. Um, and I think that experience allows me to bring a perspective to the board that others cannot. And as we emerge from COVID, as we are handling all kinds of different school safety issues over the years, that's a perspective that would be very beneficial. Um, from a life standpoint, um, I've consistently given back to the community, both here in Barrington, as a member of the Village Board of Trustees, as well as I serve on an executive board of the Child Advocacy Center in McHenry County, um, as well as I believe very strongly that the three years I spent living overseas allows me to bring a perspective to education um, and how education is looked at and handled in different parts of the world that will help the district as we you know, grow, especially coming out of this pandemic. Thank you, thank you. Um, next up is Mike Shackleton. Mike, tell us about your career and life experiences that make you uh, the most qualified person to continue in your position. And I have one minute for this. You have one minute. <laughs> okay. All right. Well, mm. make it tight. Make it tight. Yeah. Most relevant is board of BOE experience here for the last four years. Coming through the pandemic, I think is worth another ten years. But um, anyway, I've, I'm on the labor relations committee. I'm on the equity and inclusion committee. Co-chair of the facilities committee. Was the co-chair of the finance committee for two years. I have uh, experience on other school strategic and safety committees in prior district. Um, other than uh, the school district experience, I'm a board member of a nonprofit focused on achievement for inner city kids in Chicago. Um, professional experience includes both governance and higher education uh, experience in particular. Um, management consulting, strategic consulting for both nonprofit and for-profit uh, industry leaders, um, organizational design and development, recruitment, compensation. Uh, personally, the father of two children in the district here, you know, is number one. <laughs> we have a big stop sign coming up. Okay, that's enough. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for squeezing <laughs> that all into one minute. Thank you. Um, next up, um, Tom Mitterai. Tell us sure. about your career and life experience. Sure, uh, thank you. Um, I think I would bring a set of well-rounded qualifications to the board. First, I guess you'd call me a professional parent with uh, five kids who have gone through this district, but also my kids when they were younger went through schools, great schools in Japan, Virginia, and California. So I've seen a lot of the great uh, schools around the world, frankly. Um, my wife has been a staff member since 2012, working with bilingual students, and since 2019 as a one-way immersion kindergarten teacher. Uh, professionally, I've managed the planning, budgeting, design, construction, operations, maintenance of multi-billion dollar facility program budgets as a steward of uh, taxpayer money. I was a federal contracting officer, so I'm very familiar with writing, negotiating, and administering a variety of contract types. 
I've worked with various unions. I have served in volunteer positions with the Boy Scouts and churches. I'm a very value-driven person, so I'm proud that I was lucky enough uh, to work hard with uh, parents and become an Eagle Scout, and three of my boys are Eagle Scouts. I've been teaching at Northwestern for 11 years as an adjunct professor, so I know what teachers go through. I took several years to distill my thoughts on raising kids and wrote a book called Raising Capable Kids with Basic Decency, Common Sense, and Passion, available on Amazon. With all that said, I've been told I'm a good listener and I'm able to collaborate with people to solve tough issues. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, next up, um, Katie Kiram. What um, career and life experience is making you most qualified for this position? Um, okay, well, I'm going to start out with the obvious one. I'm a mom I'm with three kids in the district. I live with the consequences of the board decisions every single day. And as everyone knows, no one fights harder for the rights of children than a mom. And so this, um, I could for sure bring that to the table, but for specific to the board, I've been a volunteer or I've been on the Roslyn Road PTO for years. And anyone who's worked on the PTOs know we volunteer in the classrooms, we fundraise, we help teachers gather materials for their classes, we build, help build playgrounds, we set budgets for our PTOs. We work in every facet of helping the school run smoothly. And I think this translates great. And I actually look forward to being able to do this on a more amplified scale as a member of the Board of Education. Thank you. Thank you for staying in time. Well, um, William, you're up next. Please tell us about your career and life experience. Uh, my career experience uh, includes uh, running my own medical practice at this point where I have to uh, deal with legalese routinely. So when the lawyers come out and contracts come out, my eyes aren't gonna glaze over. I'll be looking at that line by line. I do that all the time and I'm very comfortable with it. Uh, furthermore, I'm comfortable with uh, balancing a budget and looking at cost benefit analysis. Uh, most importantly, uh, much as Katie said, um, I have three kids in the district. So if I'm not hearing about school life from my kids, I think that 99% of my uh, social time is spent with those kids' parents. And I'm going to hear about the school district all day long for the next nine years. So that's extremely valuable experience and it will continue to be a valuable experience going forward. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, um, next up is... Steve, um, Steve, tell us about your career and life experiences. Thank you. Will do. Well, first and foremost, I'm a parent, and so you know, I'm, and I'm also a single parent, and and as a result, you know, I see very clearly, um, you know, what children need and and what I can bring to the table. And personally, you know, the experiences that I think are valuable that I've had with my daughter are being a co-leader for a Girl Scout troop, being a room parent for each level that she's been in, both kindergarten and first grade. And, th and then from a volunteer standpoint, you know, taking her to soup kitchens to volunteer and also help take her to activities through uh, the University of Notre Dame's uh, club in Lake County, where I'm also on the board. From a professional standpoint, um, I've advised hundreds of clients over my 15 year career in terms of financial strategy. And currently, uh, right now, I, I help manage the strat financial strategy of a $12 billion health system. And thankfully, we got through the pandemic well, and we're still on, on target. So, you know, from, from that perspective, I hope to bring my experience to the board. Thank you. Thank you, Steve. All right, uh, next up, Jonathan Mata. What, yeah. uh, Great, thank you for the question. Um, you know, my, I, from a background perspective, uh, life experience, resiliency, um, not to bore anybody, I lost my parents in my early 20s, um, around the same time that my wife and I were starting to grow our life together. You have parents that die at the same time as you birth children, you learn a lot, right? I've got uh, deep levels of self-awareness. Um, I don't really, uh, I, you know, I'm a byproduct of a system that was like A plus B equals C, right? Or you, you go to school, you get good grades, you go to college, you're supposed to get a job. I don't think it works like that anymore. Um, I love to empathize. Professionally, I'm a designer. Um, I love to solve the latent problems of complex things. Um, when we think about COVID and the pandemic, there's a lot of explicit stuff. I'm excited about the, the latent things that we can learn from. Um, I've built uh, org design. Uh, I've, I've, I've been inside org design roles. Um, I've built cultures um, all across the board. So I'm excited to contribute a lot of creativity. Great, thank you, so thank you. All right, and last on this question is, is Lauren. Okay, you ready? Yep, go ahead. Lauren, Lauren Flower, yes. <laughs> yeah, all right, so um, 
for when I started my career, I wor worked in the spirits industry um, and worked um, on Absolute Vodka for eight years directly for the country of Sweden. And my job, you know, in at the time was to figure out how to make vodka cool again. We were trade marketers and um, educators. And instead of hiring some big marketing firm, we like hit the ground um, and traveled all over the world and worked with bartenders all over the world, right? The people who knew the business and got answers, right? So what I feel like from that experience and carrying it over now is like that that's the answer, right? I'm not always gonna have the answers, but I know where to go find them from the people that do, that work it every day. Um, I sit on the exec board for the Barrington Children's Charities and for the Huff PTO. And like Katie said, I'm a mom. So I'm in it. Yeah, uh, I think that's it. Thank you. All right. So I haven't missed anybody, have I? All right. Okay, on to our second question. Uh, this question has to do with overall goals for the board. Um, the first person to answer this one will be Lauren, or not Lauren, I'm sorry, it's Aaron. Um, and the question is, aside from dealing with COVID and the pandemic, what do you believe are the top three issues facing the school board in the next two years? Aside from the residual you know, efforts with the pandemic, what do you believe are the top three issues facing the school board in the next two years? Okay, Aaron, it's your turn to go first. <laughs> Absolutely, thank you for that question. So clearly as we return to a post-pandemic or a full-time learning schedule with the choice for those who need to stay distant, distant. Uh, I think that focusing on mental health, relational health and emotional health is key. Uh, I spend part of my volunteer hours speaking with seniors in high school who are applying to Northwestern University. It's my alma mater. And all of them have highlighted that is key issues where for the first time they sought help and they were embraced. And I think that that is key to continue to support the mental health services that we have. Uh, we have a new superintendent coming in. I think now is the time to look forward. Our last strategic plan was 2008, 2009. Um, that was very <clears throat> community based. I think at, at one time, one weekend, we had 300 community members way into that strategic plan. And we need to look at education as dynamic and as something that both from an instructional standpoint and a financial standpoint that we are adapting, uh, directing our administration to adapt. And I'm looking forward to working on that as well. Thank you, thank you. Um, next up, Robert will answer, aside from dealing with the pandemic, what do you believe are the top three issues facing the school board in the next two years? So I think the first, you know, the first one for me is the referendum allocation of the money that was passed this past year. It's $147 million uh, that is going to be allocated uh, <laughs> through that referendum. Um, and I had, had the honor of working on and, and assisting with the committee that, you know, helped get that referendum passed um, and have intimate knowledge of, you know, what went into that. And there is so much that is going to change throughout the district, so many improvements that are going to happen without the district. And managing that money wisely, continuing to be able to keep our, you know, uh, AAA bond rating within the district while we spend that amount of money um, and get those projects done efficiently is one of the most important things to me. Second is we are onboarding a new, um, a new superintendent, getting him up to speed and moving the district forward um, is very important. And those two years are going to be, you know, critical to that process. Um, and then lastly is the moving in the direction in with the diversity inclusion work within the district um, with our new director um, and getting everybody on board and moving in the same direction. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, next on this question is Mike. Um, what do you believe are the top three issues facing the school board in the next two years? Well, I think the top three <laughs> are all going to be going on simultaneously and kind of overlap, uh, which kind of is where the complexity comes in. Um, I think, you know, the first priority for me of, of everything will be meeting the students' needs where they are, both social, emotionally, and learning wise. You know, why, while onboarding a new superintendent, new board members, new board leadership as well, uh, with a focus, of course, on fiscal responsibility, right? And that includes everything we do, plus referendum, you know, 100 and 
over $150 million or close to $150 million in uh, money that we have to be good stewards with as we, uh, again, try to meet the students' needs first and foremost with what we're doing with that money. So that's it. Thank you. <clears throat> All right, um, Tom will answer the question next, aside from the pandemic, what do you think of the top three issues facing the board in the next two years? Sure, another good question. And I'm glad was, you're asking for three because that aligns nicely with my three priorities, which um, A, for academic excellence, um, tailored to individual styles of the students, we need to keep our focus on the students despite all the other things that are going around in the community. There's so much to distract us. B is for balance. Um, the students need to be balanced. We can help shape well-rounded students through opportunities in the fine arts, athletics, and other extracurricular activities, which goes a long way um, for um, mental health, which I'm sure we'll talk about. I'll, I'll bet some money that uh, people would probably ask questions about that soon. Um, but the board also needs to be balanced. We must tackle a wide variety of issues while being good stewards of the taxpayer's money. And C is for a commitment. I'm committed to equity while embracing our differences with compassion and open communication. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, um, next, um, Katie, what do you believe are the top three issues facing the board in the next two years? Um, okay, I think the obvious one is the referendum. I mean, the district put a lot of time and effort into getting that passed. Um, and I think seeing that those funds are used in the best interests of our taxpayers, our community and our children is obviously with, I think with safety being a priority which is um, obviously a top issue. Um, I've talked about mental health. I think that not only after the year of isolation of the pandemic, mental health needs to be a community and district priority forever. Um, and uh, a, a conversation we need to be having more often. And then um, lastly, I would agree the new superintendent, I feel we are ushering in a new era um, of change in our community. And I personally think along with that, we need to work more on mm -hmm. communicating with our community and making sure that we're listening to their voice and that the board is a reflection of their voice and not a reflection of our own opinions. Um, William, you're up next. Aside from the pandemic, what do you th consider the top three goals? Uh, a, a top priority is always sister. going to be yeah. um, wisely <laughs> spending. <laughs> Sorry. Go ahead. Go ahead. I was saying a top priority every year, of course, is going to be making sure that the money is spent wisely so that the taxes aren't too high and so that everyone has great services and great schools for that tax money that we are spending. Uh, so, yes, the referendum and the amount of money being spent, it's, it's eye popping. And, you know, looking at the itemized, um, you know, items, uh, the $656,000 per grade school classroom. You know, that sort of thing we need to keep a, a very close eye on, and I'll make sure that I do that. Um, a couple of other um, issues that I think are relatively new are the remote learning option, I think, should be made permanent. Um, I think that um, there are children who are going to learn best remotely, and the fact that, um, what is it, two-thirds of the high schoolers in our district are choosing to do that um, speaks volumes. We need to investigate how, how popular that is going to be going forward. And um, thank you, that's my time. Thank you, thank you. Um, next up is Steve. Steve, um, what do you consider the three top issues facing the school board? Sure, well, I would say my top three are gonna be very similar to what I've, you've already heard, but I have my own little spin. So I think Dr. Hunt certainly is gonna be a top priority, making sure we integrate him well, because frankly, his success will be the success of our district. So that's a key priority. Uh, in addition, I think the budget, so spending $147 million that's been passed is going to be critical. We need to make sure that we spend that money wisely and prudently and, and provide the best return for our students. And then in association with that would be the idea of hopefully neutralizing the levy that we place on our taxpayers annually. You know, I've, if, I, if I, in my professional life, had been given the opportunity to increase our, our uh, expense budget by 5%, 4 to 5% 5 every year, I'd have no problem having a balanced budget. Um, typically, I'm given the opportunity to do it at zero. And so I'd like to see if we do that in our district. And then thirdly, but you know, equally important, is ensuring that we have support for all our students across the board, from top to bottom, making sure that they're all equally having the opportunities to get the best education possible and having all the resources available to them. Thank you. Thank you. Um, Jonathan, what do you believe are the top three issues facing the school board? 
Thank you. Uh, students, uh, students, 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 they are the user. Um, SEL, social emotional, middle kid. Um, I think Barrington does a wonderful job um, with the high performing kid. I really get worried about the middle kid. Um, I think to do that, you have to really be thinking about how do you build a high performing team, right? You have a new CEO. Nobody likes it when I say it. It's a superintendent. I get it. It functions the same way. Um, and you have at minimum two new uh, board members, right? Um, so uh, the whole forming, storming, norming, performing, how do you accelerate a high performing leadership team that serves the students and the community? And then last but not least, obviously the strategic plan. Um, this is like referendum on steroids. You know, are we looking at where education is in, at, in, like in 2030, 2035 as board members? And are we connecting what we're doing today with the money we have so that it lives really long for like my four-year-old, for instance, right? She's got a long runway ahead of her. Thank you. All right, um, Lauren Clower, what do you believe are the top three issues facing the board? Um, thanks for the question. I think that re rebuilding community trust right now um, for like of the board is really important. Um, I think that people just don't feel heard. They didn't feel seen. They don't feel like their needs are being met. I think that open um, communication and respect um, is going to hopefully get us there. I think that's a major, major uh, to do. And I think it's harder, I, you know, it's harder. It's easier said than done. It's not harder to say. Um, I also think that mental health um, and the, like the mental well-being of students right now is so important. Um, the, the effects of this pandemic were big um, and kids, you know, were alone and dealing with it in, in some senses themselves. So I think that that's going to be a big one. I also think that the equity, racial and cultural initiatives are going to be um, a really big one um, uh, to keep pushing forward. I think that the, that um, that the ISBE legislation that passed um, is hard. And I think that a lot of families are struggling to understand. So I think as, as a board, we're gonna have to really focus on that. Great, thank you, thank you. All right, and um, last on this question, Sandra. Thank you. Um, I, I wanna address them as priorities, not necessarily issues. Um, but first is the strategic plan and introduction, introduction of Dr. Hunt. You know, the last strategic plan brought us programs like the Chinese Immersion, which we've got several parents here today um, that are using that, that program. It brought us the one-for-one -one technology. Um, it brought us blended learning um, that really all prepared us for, for, the, for the pandemic. Um, brought us a calendar change. All those things were introduced while remaining fiscally responsible. I wanna just add that I don't think I've ever, in my experience, seen in the levy increase by four and five percent. The levy can only increase by CPI and new growth by law. So you can't introduce any more than that. Your budget can't increase any more than that unless you go to, to the, the community and uh, for, for a referendum. So referendum is also a priority as we've talked about, but those funds have already been allocated. So it's our job as a board to make sure they're spent as the voters have already asked us to spend them. And then third priority would be the district equity committee. And all three of these things all have opportunities for the community engagement, which I'm really excited about. Thank you. Thank you. And you provide a perfect segue for our next topic, which is equity. Um, Robert is going to be up first. Here's a question, it's a little bit longer. During the superintendent search feedback forums, one of the biggest priorities listed was a focus on equity. Can you speak to how you envision champ championing efforts to make our school district more equitable for all of our students? All right, I'm gonna read that one more time. During this, this uh, superintendent search feedback forums, one of the biggest priorities listed was a focus on equity. Can you speak to how you envision championing efforts to make our school district more equitable for all of our students. And I'm saying all our because this is how the question was written by one of the, um, <laughs> it's not my district, it's your district. Um, <laughs> yeah, so we're starting with, um, with Robert. Um, absolutely. So, you know, obviously the, the role of the board in anything, but particularly in something like this is to provide vision, to provide guidance for the administration. Um, and I think the first thing to do, or, or the first step, you know, from here on going forward is, you know, working with our new director, working with our new committee to find out and to speak to the students and find out where things are missing, to find out, you know, what they need. Um, the most important thing that I can do, 
you know, as somebody who, who doesn't have all the answers. And I think admittedly has to admit that and say that I don't know the exact answer is to ask the committee to go out and talk to the students, talk to the students, whether it's, you know, from a minority, you know, aspect to an, an economic aspect to something else and what do they need? And then we need to give them the green light, give the committee the green light and go out and push those things forward um, to find the solution to bring everybody up to, so that everybody has the same opportunities across the board in the district. Thank you. Uh, next up on this question is Mike. Uh, quick question. When do we get the opportunity to use a rebuttal? At the, at the end of everybody's answers, when everybody has, ans has finished answering this question, then you can ask well, a rebuttal. Would you, would you then ask us at the end of that? Because I raised my hand last time and I don't- Oh, I'm sorry. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Yes. Is it, can I still rebut the last question then at some point? Yes. Yes. When would be a good time for that? Later or now? <laughs> <laughs> um, since we're, every, I think since everybody's focused on this one, let's finish this one and then we'll go to the rebuttal. I'm sorry. Okay, can you repeat this question, please? Yes. During the superintendent search feedback forums, one of the biggest priorities listed was a focus on equity. Can you speak to how you envision championing efforts to make our school district more equitable for all of our students? Well, yeah, I mean, it's obviously a complex subject, um, hyper-political times that we live in. Um, the easy answer is, you know, we've hired a new director of, I call it equity and inclusion, because I think it's going to be paramount that all stakeholders in the community are included in this and the communication be open and flowing both directions. Um, as a board member, I'll support or weigh in on any recommendations that come. I'm also fortunate to be a member, one of two board members who are actually on the committee formed that works together under the direction of Nate, our new director. So I'm kind of fortunate to be in both of those roles and I look forward to it going forward. Thank you. Um, next up on this is Tom. Sure, thanks, another great question. First of all, I'll start out with my personal experience as a parent where, whereby my um, kids are sometimes disappointed when I don't treat all of them the same. <laughs> and I found out the hard way that of course, kids are not the same, whether they're your own kids or they're in school. And equity does not mean or equate to equality. At first I thought these were the same thing. I mean, it seems natural to want to say that we must treat people equally. Of course, there are certain things we are we owe every person such as basic respect and treatment and dignity, but equality means everyone has the same rights, opportunities, and resources. Equity takes into consideration the differences that individual students have. And there are disadvantaged students in our classrooms and they need resources that fit their circumstances. And, but there are many barriers to equity, even in our community with family crises, mental health issues, lack of health care, coming to school hungry, and, and the list goes on. So I would like to work closely with the first ever director of equity, race and cultural diversity initiatives, Nate Rouse, as well as some of the groups in the community, such as Courageous mm -hmm. Conversation, Change Barrington, in order to identify and implement ways in which we can bring about meaningful change. Thank you. Katie is up next. Can you speak to how you envision championing efforts to make our school district more equitable for all students? Sure. Um, I'm going to echo what a lot of people can say. And I say we um, we need to utilize our new director. And I agree, go out to the community, go out to the students, go out to marginalized groups around our in our district and ask them what their needs are, first and foremost, um, before I can speak to anything specific. I think we need to hear from all sides and work through that. Um, I've also said I, if there has been nothing equitable about this last year of remote and hybrid learning. Um, <clears throat> You know, not everyone has the same resources to hire tutors, upgrade their internet, do everything. So we, um, I think we need to make sure that going forward, um, all of our children have the same resources and access to education, resources and education, um, uh, things to help them with their education. So that, um, so our number one priority should be advancing academic excellence within our community for every single child and every marginalized group deserves to be seen, heard and lifted up. Thank you, thank you, Katie. Um, next up, William, can you speak to how you envision championing, pushing efforts toward equity? 
yes, I think that making sure that the uh, students and parents in our district have lots of different options whenever possible will go a long way to making sure that people are treated fairly, make sure that equity everyone understands is fair, you know, fairness. Um, people have different interests and um, it, it's important if people are referring to racial equity, um, there's going to be just different trends in different preferences. If you look at the group of national merit scholars that come out of 220 versus the uh, roster for the football team, it's a completely different group and potentially both are winning. People are getting what they want and our school needs to accommodate lots of different interests and lots of different uh, needs for our school district. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, next up, uh, Steve Wang, how do you envision making our school district more equitable for all students? Well, for me, it's a simple answer. Uh, you know, uh, bringing Nate Rouse in was a good decision by the school board, and I think we should utilize his skills and his team skills to the fullest extent possible. So I will, I would plan to work with him very closely, as well as his staff. In addition, I would also, you know, seek to hear the voice of the community. I'd want to solicit feedback from neighbors from, from across the spectrum in our district and making sure I understand what their needs are. Because admittedly, this is somewhere I need education myself. And then, you know, from a more actionable standpoint, at least at the outset, it would be to make sure that everyone has the same resources available to them. You know, we can't ensure equality, but we can at least make sure that equitably, everybody has the same opportunities to get the education that they so, so rightly deserve. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, next up, Jonathan. <clears throat> Yeah, thank you. Um, you know, we are different, right? I think um, not to be cheesy, but like we, we're different. That's what makes us strong. And we celebrate that. Um, I think when I think about it, it's really understanding the whole child, the whole human, right? Um, and really empathizing and seeking to empathize to understand. So a, a bunch of my peers have mentioned this idea that obviously we empathize, right? Um, I think it's critical to then have skill sets that say, okay, well, we empathized. How did we find patterns, either explicit or latent, and then uh, use those to leverage change? Um, I'm all about access and opportunity. Um, and when I think about, again, when we think about equity, if we think about like socioeconomic uh, stuff, it's about elevating access and opportunity to things. And you've heard me say this before, but, but active forms of instruction, like an incubator program, I'm, I'm just huge on that. And that helps elevate outcomes. Doesn't, doesn't give equal outcomes, but it helps elevate outcomes for all people. Thank you. All right, uh, next on this question, Lauren Clower. How do you envision making the school district more equitable for all students? Yeah, so, um... Like a lot of people said, I think it's amazing what Nathaniel Rouse and his committee um, on equity, racial and cultural, cultural initiatives is doing. Um, I think that they're, they're the ones that are gonna have the answers, right? Or they're going to help us find answers. I think that um, going to them and trusting and taking direction from those committees, the subcommittees, committees or um, organizations like Be The Change or Courageous Conversations um, is really gonna get us like is going to be a good guide for getting us to make changes in professional development and curriculum and community relationships. So like I said before, I think going to the pros, right? Going to people who know, because I myself am a student um, still in um, equity and racial and cultural initiatives. Thank you. Thank you, Laura. Uh, next up, Sandra. Thank you for this question. I, th I think this is one area where we have so much to learn from the students. Um, I've told this story once before where I, I talked to some high school students recently and asked them what equity and, and inclusion meant to them. And they responded that it really, having equity means it's better for all of us, right? It makes things better and it removes, removes some divisiveness. I think it's also about understanding our differences, but also finding our similarities. Um, I think that the board and the equity statement has given the direction to the administration to operationalize and as Lauren mentioned, I think that how the district equity committee has gone about um, their pre they gave a presentation and update uh, a couple of weeks ago was very, was very good. It brought thoughtful change Four subcommittees were around thoughtful or were around professional development, communication and awareness, policy and procedures and long term and short term planning. I think we have to look at our policies and our procedures to make sure that um, we don't have any systemic issues there. We've got to find 
ways to train our staff and ourselves on um, learning our own personal biases. Thank you. Thank you. All right, and uh, last on this question, Erin, please. What are your thoughts on uh Yes, yeah, thank, you. thank you for this question. So for me, being a woman of color is my own lived experience. Um, and from pre-kindergarten through high school, I was the only Asian American in every single one of my classes. I look around at where we are in, in the, our Barrington 220 community, and I'm so excited because I think we're poised for a seminal change. I've already been in conversation with Nate Rouse, who's directing our DEI efforts, with Courageous Conversations, with Be the Change Barrington, with parents and families who have equity as a concern. And I'm so grateful for these honest and open spaces where we're understanding each other's pain, fully accepting each other's stories, and then using that information to move forward together as a community. And when I talk about diversity, I'm talking not just about race, but also about age, geography, class, neurodivergence, accessibility, and ability. And these are important because of three things inclusion and rep our stories being represented, uh, hiring and representation among the staff, and also safety so that our students can feel protected. And this is a journey that we as a community all need to take together. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much. Um, Mike, do you have a rebuttal? Okay, this is 30 seconds, right? 30 seconds. I'm going to talk fast, okay? The question was, don't include this in the, in the talk, please. Um, to separate from the recovery from COVID, what are the three priorities other, otherwise, correct? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Okay. So first, I don't think we can separate it. Um, I think the real challenge is going to be to thoughtfully consider a lot of important initiatives going forward while maintaining excellence, right? So the strategic plan and uh, the equity work will provide good opportunities for engagement. In addition, you have a new teacher's contract to negotiate for the next two years. You've got to figure out the remote distance uh, learning option in a way that works for everyone, right? And then we have the referendum work, which we have to, we have to manage without interrupting learning, which is, I can't go into it now more, but maybe later. All right, there's your 30, sorry. <laughs> Thanks. Any other rebuttals? I'll, I'll ask this at the end of every question from you now, going forward now. Okay, we're going to move on to, we're going to, um, we're, uh, perfect segue again from Mike's uh, last statement. Um, the topic is diversity. What are your thoughts and when you're talking, speaking about the teaching, the teacher's contract, and what are your thoughts regarding increasing the number of diverse educators and administration within the district? What would be a recruiting strategy? What are your thoughts regarding increasing the number of diverse educators and administrators within the district and what would be a recruiting strategy? The first person, oh, Mike, there you go. You're up here first on this. <laughs> well, thanks. It should, we'll this one should be, in my, should be in my wheelhouse because that's what I do for a living. Um, so best practice is you'd like mm -hmm. your employee, you know, population to represent well your customer base, if you will, or if I'll borrow one of John, Juan Mata's terms, you know, our user, our user base. So we do want to get a look at what that looks like, right? We want to keep that in mind as we go out and recruit staff and, and teachers um, so that we become a community that's inclusive versus one that where one layer or one piece looks much different than another, basically. Those are general terms. Now there are strategies for how to recruit those people, but as board members, we trust the staff. We only manage the superintendent who manages his assistant superintendents. And um, so it's not like we can tell them what to do specifically, right? We work together as a team. Thank you, thank you. Um, next up on this question is Tom. What are your thoughts regarding um, Diverse hiring practices. Where are you? There you are. Sure. Um, well, first, I think I should step back and you know talk about what diversity means to me. And diversity to me means differences in physical appearances, orientation, beliefs, uh, religious uh, practices, opinions, interests, etc., um, abilities even. And we need a diversity in students, teachers, admin staff, and board members. And certainly, um, students want 
would also feel more comfortable if there's teachers who um, they can relate to. Um, so I think it's really important. Um, I think that the, um, in order to recruit uh, more diverse students, we need to get the word out that this is a welcoming place for people coming from all different backgrounds. And if people don't have that vibe, we're not gonna succeed even if we locate very highly qualified candidates. Um, but you know, diversity um, and some of the things that go along with racism and things all based on fear, uncertainty, misguided beliefs. And they, that must be replaced with curiosity, compassion, communication, and basic human respect. So we need to um, weave that through our recruiting process and, and walk the talk. Thank you. Thank you. Um, Katie, what are your thoughts on um, hiring diverse educators and administrators? Right, um, kind of to echo some of what's been said, I do think we need to work as a team with our superintendent and our staffs and our teachers to show how amazing D220 is and how successful we are and what a great district we are and be a more welcoming, be a welcoming district um, and make people want to come here and work and teach. Um, so, uh, and a staff that is um, comprised of many talents and backgrounds and diversity can only enhance the learning experience for our children. So in order to maintain our reputation of academic excellence, we should strive to ensure we hire the best applicants um, that cover many backgrounds in order to enrich the learning experience for our children in our district. Thank you. Um, William, what are your thoughts regarding this topic? Diversity. I think that our district should have a policy of not discriminating uh, based on race or any other immutable characteristic. I think that our uh, community and the teachers uh, should be united by the goal of having a really great educational experience. And that should be the thing that unites us regardless of our backgrounds, our race, or any of these other immutable characteristics. Thank you. Thank you. Um, Steve, what are your thoughts on this? Well, I'm, I'm all in favor of having a diverse staff. I guess my, I guess my uh, you know, addition here though is we need to make sure that we hire the best candidates for the job. Um, you know, by doing a lot of the things that I've already heard in terms of making it a welcome and open community, providing top dollar in terms of compensation for our teachers, those are all gonna be things that are gonna be key in recruiting folks of, of the greatest caliber of talent. But as I've said, you know, I'll, I'll, I believe it's gonna be critical to you know, make an effort to make sure that it reflects the community. But the reality is that I'm, I'm a big proponent of making sure that we hire the best candidate. Thank you. Thank you. Um, Jonathan, what are your thoughts about recruiting a diverse um, staff? Yeah, I mean, as a professional, um, you know, the more divergent we can get with uh, when we empathize and seek to understand. And, and, and just to be candid, the, the way to get very divergent is to celebrate diversity, right? Um, it brings in a lot of stuff that we didn't otherwise think about. And so I will give a nod to Mike, um, the comment about aligning with culture, right? And this idea that um, while we do that, I do think it, it's critical that we understand um, the culture that we are. Um, you know, call me naive, I've been called it before. Um, Barrington is a loving, open, welcoming, accepting place. Um, and if, if that is what I call an identity, the story I tell about it, and, and, and somebody wants to say the reputation or the story that other people say about Barrington is very different than that, then we have to have that conversation. Um, but I, yeah, I, I'll stop. Thank you. You guys took the mute button away from us. It's, I'm telling you, one of the best hacks on mute on Zoom is just mute yourself right when you're done. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, all right, uh, next up, Lauren, what are your thoughts on re uh, recruiting a diverse? Yeah, so my thought is this, like, what, you know, what we want for our kids, right, is a world of inspirational adults, is what I think, right? And not, not cookie cutter, not the same. I think it's so important that we promote um, diversity amongst the educators and administrators. I think, again, like, um, was I think was said before, you know, we're going to work with the new superintendent and work with the current administrators to make sure we're doing that. And we're, you know, we're finding the best people for the jobs, but also considering that we really do want to push for diversity. And I liked that Jonathan just said that um, and celebrate it, right? 
it's good to be different. It's good for our kids to know different and it's good to, good to celebrate it. Thank you, thank you. Uh, next up, Sandra. Thank you, great question. Um, so first I just wanted to make a comment that the new superintendent was, was hired in part because of his alignment with our equity statement. So I think that, that that's a big help. I think that Barrington sells itself quite a bit to attract talent. Um, we're, we've been named for two years in a row, the top one of the top workplaces in the Chicagoland area by Chicago Tribune. Um, the, the offerings that we have at all levels for STEM education and language education are attractive to, to, um, to um, professionals. And um, also I think the district equity committee is gonna have a great part here too. I already talked about the professional development. They can help us with recruiting um, and training and policy and procedure. Um, I want to say too that the board can direct the superintendent. The board hires one person, which is the superintendent, but we can direct the superintendent to make strategic hires diverse and provide targets and other things to make more diverse staff. Um, and we do have a policy um, to not discriminate already. I want to make sure that's clear. The district does have a policy already. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. Um, next on this question is, is Aaron. Um, what are your thoughts on? You know, recruiting a diverse staff. Absolutely. So we do want to attract the, the highest caliber, highest quality teachers we can, and we can find high quality teachers everywhere. I think the key question is, where are we looking and how are we going about our approach? And so our district has about 40% students of color right now, according to the Illinois State Board of Education. Um, our staff is about 12% teachers of color. Um, about one out of five kids are neurodivergent. Uh, I, I doubt that we have 20% of staff who are trained well um, in neurodivergence. And so I think it's really important to be intentional about hiring so that we can best represent our community. And so when we have attrition, when we have retirements, these are our opportunities to ask, are we going to historically black colleges and universities? Are we working with organizations that focus on differently abled to recruit? And just as important is retention as well. So I think if we adopt an equity-based mindset around decision-making, these hires will come naturally if we, and with intention. Okay, and last answer on this question, Robert. Thank you very much. Um, you know, getting go, you know, coming last with this answer, obviously um, agree with a lot of what has been said. So I will try to not, you know, uh, repeat too much. But I think, you know, my, my, I guess my thoughts on increasing diversity is it's not just something we need to think about, it's something that's important. I think it is critical. I think the, you know, diverse, diverse hires for teachers and for administrators is critical to the district because it's critical to our students. Um, there is countless research out there that shows that people learn better, people strive to do better when they have mentors that they relate to. Um, and then for the same, for the flip side, it is you know, good for people to see and to be taught by somebody with a different background to learn more about that. And how we do that, how we get there is all about the recruiting process. It is about saying, no, we're not going to necessarily hire this person because they are diverse, but we are going to reach out to different channels to find people, whether like Aaron said, it's historically black colleges, whether it is reaching to someplace else to Chicago to bring in applicants that may not be looking to come up here because we get the applicants in, the hires will follow. Thank you. Thank you, thank you. All right, moving on to a different topic now. And um, Tom was going to be up first on this question. And again, it's a little bit longer. Um, it's in multiple parts. And the topic is um, gun safety. As students return to school, a big issue is how we can help students feel safe on school campuses. What position or positions will you take as a school board member regarding active shooter drills, educating the community on safe gun storage practices, and arming teachers? I'll read it yeah, one more time. I'll, yeah. Thank you. <laughs> I'll read it one more time. As students return to school, a big issue is how we can help students feel safe on school campuses. What position or positions will you take as a school board member regarding active shooter drills, educating the community on safe gun storage practices, and arming teachers? We tried to condense several questions into this one. <laughs> In the sake of time, Mary, yeah. Uh, 
All right, so Tom, yeah. it's your turn to answer first. Sure. Okay. Yeah, thanks. Um, yes, that certainly is a good question considering the rise in school related gun violence over the past several years. Um, this issue has been um, discussed in various forums, even, you know, talk about whether school boards should have the authority to um, approve arming of, of the teachers. So I'll start with that first. Um, you know, uh, some other schools have a much higher threat of violence than we have in this area. Um, I, with that said, I do not think it would be wise to arm teachers in Barrington schools with guns. As a retired military officer, I rarely call them guns. We are trained to call them weapons as a reminder of their deadly purpose. Um, perhaps weapons would provide a deterrent to some people with bad intentions, but we already have an armed resource officer at the high school, and I don't think we want to make a point of displaying weapons and becoming um, that kind of feel on our schools. If the board were to disagree with me and they voted to allow Armenian teachers, then I would push to have a very robust program. Weapons, especially handguns, take a significant amount of training to become proficient. Trained police officers hit their targets less than 50% of the time at close range, say less than 7%. Um, oh, this that was already over. Wow, that was a quick time. <laughs> uh, yeah, that's hard to answer three three questions in uh, in one. In what, um, yeah, in one. In but I, I, yeah, and I certainly support uh, active shooter drills. Um, okay. And and I support storing safely guns at home, of course, as well. Thank you. Thank you. All right, Katie, you see how difficult it is to answer this in the studio. Yeah, I have like, my, my thoughts are honestly racing right now, but okay. So from a, having kids feel safe on campus, I'm gonna start with, I'm so glad with the referendum, the priority was getting rid of our mobiles and uh, putting man traps in at all the school entrances. Honestly, um, our, I went to school in a mobile at, in Barrington and I'm not gonna tell you how old I was. So it's about time we took care of that. Um, I don't think this is a political issue at all. Um, I believe we, our safety of our children and our staff needs to be a number one priority. So we should, I think we should have active shooter drills on a regular basis so that it is um, by route and teachers know where to go, the kids know where to go and um, that we have a plan in place and we work with our local police on in order to do that and make sure that all safety measures are where they should be. Um, I, yes, I believe that we should be encouraging gun owners to responsibly secure their firearms at home. Um, that seems like a no-brainer to me, but obviously, um, I'm trying. So, sorry, wrap it up, all three. There we go. <laughs> <laughs> thank you, thank you. Yeah, this is the most challenging one. William, you're, uh, it's your turn to answer. Would you like I to think that. It? Yeah, would you like me to read it again? Uh, no, that's fine. With regards to um, active uh, shooters and school shootings, I think a very important um, aspect of that is looking after the uh, mental health of our students and largely being reassuring. It's, it's very important not to, um, to overstress this risk to students. It can be put in perspective um, with them and let them know approximately how dangerous is it compared with being struck by lightning or something much, much more dangerous like taking a long car ride right, good drive to Detroit. So I think that that's going to be a very important aspect of it. When it comes to the um, gun measures, um, I think that it's very important to keep in mind that if the guns are uh, stored in classrooms, children have access to classrooms and children are very inquisitive by nature, we encourage it. And we largely need to keep guns away from curious children. So not in classrooms, but I am actually in favor of um, guns being in the school offices where there's nonstop um, administrators present, not a lot of uh, children having access there. Thank you. Thank you. Um, Steve, it's your turn to answer. Would you like me to read it again? No, oh, thank you. And, th and thank you for the question. Um, I will say this is difficult, but, and, and it's unfortunate that in this day and age, we do need to talk about active shooter training, but yes, I'm certainly in favor of doing so. But in addition to that, I would be in favor of also facilitating some sort of training for our students, identifying mental health issues and, and knowing that they have a safe place to go and report these. Because I think when I look at the statistics for school shootings historically, it's all based on things that could, it's all based on situations that might've been avoided had someone said something, whether it's the parents, the, the students or, or teachers. Um, as far as storage goes, certainly agree. It, like, like Katie said, it's a no brainer. You need to make sure that parents are storing as well as if it's in schools, the teachers are storing guns in a safe location away from children. Um, and then as far as uh, arming teachers, I'll be honest, I don't know the answer to that one. Um, I would say that I need to work very closely 
with the safety officials, whether it's the police department or otherwise, but making sure we use our resources and, you know, identifying a good, safe plan to keep our children safe. And that's, you know, that's the mode I would take. Thank you. Thank you. Um, Jonathan, you're up next on the issues of active shooter drills, educating the community on safe gun storage practices and arming teachers. Yeah, well, I'm going to, um, I'm going to ruin my minute chance here anyway, because I'm, I'm, I'm impressed by how our, all of us were able to address the diversity question and equity question is significantly more uh, like, it would almost seem like an easier thing to answer than, than a gun related one. And I think that shows when we put our attention to something, how we can grow, right? And I think so that that gives a foundation for how you would address something that otherwise becomes a very uncomfortable <clears throat> topic, guns. Um, I, when I think about active shooters, I, I think the BPD has done an incredible job. I'm a huge, huge, uh, I, mean, I live in the community. I live in the village. I think we have a great police department. Um, and I know they do active shooter drills. And I know my kids come home and have talked about what they, we talk about. I do think through the lens of COVID, I emailed Travis Lobbins the other day. And I mentioned about how I was taking a picture to get my kid out of the school. I know we design man traps, but here's a great example. There's something that we've had to do because of COVID that might be something we can learn from that makes a school environment even safer. I didn't get to answer all of it, sorry. But you finished right on time. Uh, thank you. Um, Lauren. Okay, next slide through this. So um, as far as active shooter drills, I think that they're necessary. I think it's so sad and so unfortunate, but it's necessary. You've got to know what to do um, to remain safe uh, within the schools. I think that educating um, gun owners and the community on safe gun storage is imperative. I think that most of the school shootings that have occurred are not by the gun of the, the person doesn't own that gun. That child didn't purchase that gun illegally. They were able to find it somewhere. So I think that safe gun storage is uh, really important when there are kids um, in the house or even if not. And arming teachers. I don't love the idea of arming teachers. I don't like fighting guns with more guns. What I do think is security measures um, are always have to be top of mind. I do would like if there's always a security um, guard uh, on on campus somewhere in each school if you know if budgets would allow. But I do think that there's a community or a committee in place. Um, right now in the district that with police officers from all the stations. Um, so I think we should listen to them for guidance. Sorry. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, next, Sandra. Thank you. Uh, good question. Um, so first, I just want to thank the community because a significant portion of our referendum dollars is targeted to safety and security. So thank you for that. It helps us establish our buildings to be more safe and secure. Um, I am thankful for the drills that we've already had in the past that have been mentioned by some of the other candidates. Um, if we hadn't had some of those drills, um, the unfortunate incident that occurred a few years ago at the high school, we would not have reacted as well as we did. Um, I think that, so if drills are important, I think they need to be a level and age appropriate. Um, gun storage. I think we are in the business of education. I think we can do more to educate the families in Barrington 220 about how to safely store guns if they, if they need them at their home. And lastly, arming teachers. Um, I don't see a need to arm teachers in Barrington 220. Um, I think that we let the educators in our district to focus on what they do best, um, which is educate our, our children um, and be aware um, and, and help us to identify those mental health issues that might prevent some incidents in the future. Thank you. Thank you. Um, next on this answer uh, is Erin. So I think all of us as parents, um, we see it critical, right, that our kids feel physically safe and protected in our schools. And so I'm also very really grateful that we have a school a resource officer at the high school um, in, who is trained uh, in, in what he does um, and is equipped to, to defend the high school. I also think we need to be in lockstep with public safety. I think our public safety response times to Huff, for example, uh, when there are drills, I think it's less a minute or less. And so you need to, I think we need to continue coordinating uh, with our public safety officials. I also think we need to fully fund our psychologists, our school psychologists, um, our mental health professionals, um, and, and make sure that we are walking 
uh, students through um, some of the anxiety and the depression that can come through, uh, you know, so with some of these stories, um, these tragedies around school shootings. Um, and lastly, 80% of active shooters uh, obtain their guns through friends or family. And so gun storage at the, in homes is critical that we focus on training and educating our families around that. So. Thank you, thank you. Um, next then we have uh, Robert. Thank you very much. I'm gonna see if I can work backwards here with the two kind of shorter answers for myself. Um, I, I'm not a fan of army teachers. I'm always one to educate myself. I'm always one willing to listen. I'm always, you know, if they're professionals and more research comes out that, that it works and will protect our kids, um, we need to do whatever we can to protect our children. Um, at this point, based on all the information that I have, that is not the way to do it. Uh, when it comes to educating the community, you know, yes, exactly what Aaron said. The large percentage of active shooters get their guns from friends and family. We need to be active in the community to prevent that from happening. Um, and then the last one is, you know, encompassing making our students feel safe you know, making sure the plan is there. And so active, active shooter drills have to be part of the process, um, but we have to work with the mental health professionals. We have to work with the professionals across the board in this to know what should happen with our students there, what should happen in high school, what should happen in middle school, because these things need to be age appropriate. And we need to learn um, how much, you know, how much we're doing and how much damage we're doing to them at the same time. So thank you. Thank you. All right, and last on this uh, question, which is, by the way is the last question, um, is Mike. Can you repeat it, please? Of course. Um, as students return to school, a big issue is how can we help students feel safe on school campuses? What positions will you take as a school board member regarding active shooter drills, educating the community on gun storage practices, safe gun storage practices, and arming teachers? Okay, so I think that um, students feeling safe is obviously hugely important and probably more so. I, th I know of some students that feel that are so afraid of this COVID that they're more afraid than normal, right, to even go to school. So how we handle that in general is very important. And so educating, bring in the, the drills, for example, Again, yeah, I think that has to be age specific to an extent and can be done in a way that is less alarming, especially with the younger kids. I, I think of when I was in second grade and had to do a tornado drill and go put my knees, between, my head between my knees, you know, in case, right? But I knew it was very unlikely it would ever happen. Um, as far as securing firearms, it's a no brainer. It's part of gun training. Yeah, you, you gotta be really careful. And so, I think most gun owners are very responsible and know that, but there are always exceptions in any large group. So how do we reach everybody? That's a, that's a tough one, I'm not sure. Um, and then arming teachers, you know, that came up as part of an ISB resolution that we as a district had to vote on to cover the entire state. So for districts that don't have the resources we have with an armed officer on premises and a great local police force nearby, they may need to do something, but for us, it was never brought up in that way to begin with. So whoever's asking that question for should Barrington Arm teachers, I'd like to know who they are. I'd like to hear from them. I'd like to have a conversation with them because I don't even know why that's come up as a question, to be honest. Thank you so much. And now we're, we're almost out of time. So we'll move into your closing statements. I have dozens more questions. So I, I really appreciate the response and the number of questions that have come into us. We could uh, probably be here till midnight if we wanted to answer all of them. So I'm sorry about that. And certainly appreciate your time and your thoughtful answers. So going uh, first in, we're in the um, closing statements will be Katie. You have one hey. minute. One minute. Oh, I, I well, I thought it was less. So first, thank you so much for hosting this forum. I think it's a great way to get our voices out to the community. I know with 11 candidates running, it's kind of hard to differentiate between all of us. But my number one priority if elected will be our children, period. Um, I, I think especially after this last year, our focus uh, really needs to be on getting them back on track. Um, they're our greatest asset. Um, I promise to listen to all sides of the issues and really represent the voice of our community. Um, that has been 
one of my biggest gripes, um, as I, many of us feel unheard, as, as Lauren has pointed out. Um, and also, as John, Jonathan pointed out, the middle of the road kids, um, I feel they've, they've been lost, especially this last year. Um, I also believe it's imperative the board stays current and has a continuous influx of new ideas, ideas and leadership. That's why for myself personally, I will only run for two terms if elected. Um, I believe we, the board needs to stay current and needs to represent our community. Thank you. Thank you. Um, next up, William, your closing statement, please. Yeah, thank you for all of your attention, those of you who are still with us. Uh, my name is William Betts. Uh, to learn more, you can uh, look at my website at uh, bettsforbarrington.com. I'm going to uh, make sure that our schools stay open uh, safely. We have a permanent remote option that our um, tax dollars are spent wisely. Thank you. Thank you. Um, next up on your closing, Steve Wang. Thank you. Well, I'm going to start by thanking my daughter because she's the one who inspired me to embrace this vocation to serve this wonderful district. Um, when I think about her and I consider all the children as well as the parents and taxpayers in this community, I feel compelled to run and to, to make sure that we continue to you know, forward the mission of this wonderful district as, as far as academic excellence goes, make sure that tax dollars are spent in the most you know, wise way possible. And then frankly, making sure that the board is accountable for all the actions they've done and all the decisions they make for this wonderful community. And so you know, in, in, do, in saying all that, I can commit to listening to this community making sure that I work with subject matter experts when making decisions, being a voice for all those taxpayers, and then utilizing my 15 years of corporate financial experience to you know, manage everything as well as all, all these different voices. And so I humbly ask for your vote and I look forward to answering any questions. And so please reach out and let me know if there's anything I could speak to anyone about. Thank you. Thank you. All right, uh, next on the closing is Jonathan. Yeah, thank you. I appreciate the opportunity. Um, you know, for somebody who <laughs> I'm kind of like the antithesis of anything political. So even the C word campaign freaks me out a little bit. Um, this has been fun today. And I appreciate, you know, <laughs> we're all in this thing together and we all live in the same community and, and to my peers here, all 10 of you that I'm running with, thank you guys. Um, there were multiple times here where I wrote down, that was a good idea. Um, so I, I, I walk away inspired. And I think if, if given the opportunity to be a part of our board, um, I'm obsessive over user experience. I want to inspire them, our students. I want to serve them. I'm a creative leader. And I love to solve complex problems. And part of that is obviously a strategic vision as we move forward as a community and district. Thanks. Uh, thank you so much. Uh, next on the closing is Lauren Clower. Your one minute, please. All right, I like that, Jonathan. I'm gonna say thank you too to everybody because I think it, it it's an interesting situation we're all in and we've, we're handling it, in my opinion, quite well. Um, I wanna, oh, and thank you for hosting this today too. This is great. Yeah, so I think in closing, I think a big part of um, the, the new board or the next elected um, board members is gonna be rebuilding trust. I've said it a few times, I keep saying it. Um, I think I'm the guy for the job. <laughs> I um, really do feel like open, honest communication. I think respect amongst, um, for, for respect for everybody, whether or not my opinions align. Like I plan to be um, a board member who serves the community, who votes for the community and first and foremost for the kids. So that's my, that's my bet. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Um, Sandra, your closing, please. Well, I just got to continue with the thanking of all the candidates. I, I really am energized by all of you and looking forward um, to seeing what the new board, board can do. Um, public education is a cornerstone of American democracy. You know, Barrington's a great example of that. I want to I want to continue to serve and I want to give back to the community that has given so much to me. I'm committed to making decisions that are in the best interest of the students, the staff and the entire community. <laughs> And while I, my youngest will have graduated high school by the time that this term is over, I wanna make sure that the entire community is represented. In Barrington 220, most of our voting public doesn't have kids in school. So I think it's important to represent the entire district with the board. Um, change is good. I'm really energized by the change, but change with experience is even better. So I welcome the opportunity to serve on the coming board so we can consistently and seamlessly continue to lead this district <laughs> 
Visit my website, Sandra for 220, and most importantly, vote on October 6th. Thank you. Thank you. Um, next up is Erin Chan Ding, closing. Yes, I believe this is the last of our candidate forums. So congratulations, everybody. I think we made it. <laughs> and I'm so encouraged to see so many of my fellow parents and community members want to serve our district. It's really been quite the adventure here. So I talked about my three E's earlier, and I'd like to expound on them a little bit. So to me, equity in all things means exercising fairness, agility, and nuance in all parts of decision-making, from reopening our school as well, which we're doing, to hiring, to awarding contracts. Effective communication to me means breaking down potentially harder to understand pieces of the Board of Education and administration, like how we increase tax levies uh, and using platforms like social media and other digital forms. It means listening well at town halls and coffees to create true partnership with the community and including every voice. Exceptional stewardship to me means ensuring transparency and fiscal responsibility. You've entrusted us with two precious things, your kids and your taxpayer dollars, and we have a responsibility to take care of both. Please check out erinfor220.com and don't forget to vote during early voting, March 22nd through April 5th and on election day on April 6th. Thank you. Um, Robert, it's time for your close. Thank you very much. Um, and to echo everybody else, thank you to the League of Women Voters. Thank you everybody that joined us today. Um, you know, an, a, an educated electorate is very important. So thank you for coming. Um, and thank you to everybody, to my fellow candidates here. Uh, this has been a wonderful day. Um, I'll take this last minute just to kind of, you know, I think we did a good job and I appreciate not all these questions having to do with, um, with COVID, but I think it is still the, something that I would like to address that to me, the most important priority for this incoming board is doing a postmortem on what we did right and what we did wrong over the last year. I think it is very important that we look back, um, we figure out where the decisions were right and the decisions were wrong based on new information and where the process was right and where the process was wrong because we don't know what the future holds. We don't know what the future holds with COVID um, and we don't know what the next emergency is going to be. And so I think I will be able to provide a good perspective, um, a good background in putting together that, you know, in being part of that process. Um, and I think that is, you know, one of the very first thing this new board should be addressing. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for bringing up the point about COVID too. We just, <laughs> that was going to be my last question. We didn't, no. the, the post, the post didn't get to. We've all answered lots of questions about COVID. So it was okay to answer <laughs> other questions today. I know, but looking forward. Yeah, but looking forward. I know. Um, Mike, uh, it's your turn next for your close. So, uh, thank you. Any, any change initiatives that we undertake need to have the, the kids as the focus, what's best for the kids, obviously, but it's school boarding 101, but sometimes it's questioned. Um, so we have to focus also on meeting their learning needs, right? Um, one highlight for me has been, um, you know, hiring our new superintendent. I, I'm very hopeful that we're going to all do a great job together with his leadership. You know, um, this, if I'm fortunate to be elected, this will be my last term. My youngest will be graduating high school in four years, if that goes as planned. Um, so, you know, no, no matter how much I love it, I won't do this again. Um, I'd like to thank my wife and family too for the sacrifice of their time or our time together over the past four years, because it's, it's not insignificant. Uh, and I really appreciate that to allowed me to serve the community so far. And the last, I, I think we need to keep a close eye on the referendum work, not interfering or interrupting the learning of the kids, especially at the high school, because it's gonna take place over a couple of years. And if any of you have ever had a renovation go on in your home while you live there, you know what I'm talking about. I wouldn't recommend that. So that's something that I don't hear being talked about much. We're gonna to have to do a good job of that. Thank, thank you so much. And finally, Tom, you're, you're closing. All right, thank you. So I've tried to live a life in service. Um, one of those experiences was serving the Navy for 21 years. And I remember on a particularly difficult deployment, um, a master chief came up to me and said, hey, Lieutenant, do you know what Navy stands for? I'm like, no, what do you mean? Never again volunteer yourself. And he walked away laughing. I still remember that. And um, my experiences with volunteer organizations are some of the best things you can do. And I think I know what I'm getting to. I think all the candidates here know what they're getting into. Um, it can be at times a thankless job. But luckily, the situation we're in is we're a community not of apathy. We're a community of passion. And I'd much rather be in that type of community where we can work together, 
figure out, you know, how to solve our, our, our challenges, make sure we understand each other's perspective um, and do great things to make a really good district even better, a place where we're proud to be, a place where people want to come to as a district. Um, so I'll focus on my ABCs, the academic excellence and balance and the commitment to diversity, equity, and inclusion. Uh, please, you know, study more of the candidates, learn about them, and I, I would appreciate your vote in the April 6th election. And I wish all the candidates good luck. Really appreciate everybody stepping up. Thank you. Thank you. All right. Thank you. And I would like to thank all of you for participating today, too, and just putting yourself out there and with such passion. We really appreciate it. Um, we would encourage all of you to recycle your campaign signs. We have information on our website about that. Um, also, uh, early voting starts March 22nd. If you're not registered, there's information on our website as well, the League of Women Voters Palatine area. Um, remember, your vote is your voice. And a uh, little announcement from the, from the library. There is another forum coming up at four o'clock if you're interested. Uh, it's on the, um, of course, it's on the, for the Barrington Library Board. So take a little break. Um, there, the information about it is in the chat. Um, if you'd like to stick around, take a break, and come back on at four. Um, and from all of us at the League of Women Voters, thank you so much. It's been a pleasure. Thank you. Thank you so thank much. You. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thanks again.